Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Field. On the program tonight, we have John Cameron, the author of Rekill, Rewire, and Aristocracy, and the uh, development officer at Pacific Legal Foundation. Also, Ted Juba, who is a, a candidate uh, in 2020 and maybe earlier for the uh, first Senate district in California. Welcome to the show. Uh, the independent uh, media is getting zucked. First, they came for Alex Jones, and nobody cared because he was a conspiracy theorist and a, and a rabble rouser. Then they came for, well, just about anybody else that has an independent voice in politics. Some, um, what, 800 uh, websites got taken down one day uh, a week or so ago uh, on, on Facebook, and many of them were simultaneously uh, taken down on, on Twitter. What is going on, Ted? I don't think we've yet grappled with the moral implications of the ability for anyone to send a message to 100 million people inside of 100 milliseconds. That's a relatively new thing to happen to humanity. And we really haven't figured out what that means for our society. And I think we have to. If you look at Facebook, Twitter, banning somebody like Alex Jones, not to my taste, but certainly a rabble rouser, and he deserves his First Amendment rights, that he can be taken off of that distribution without so much as due process. That's a private company. It's a private platform. It is. You're right. And I'm curious where those tech companies found that argument when they were talking about network neutrality. The ISPs, they're private companies. They can charge whatever they want to for access to their pipes. So there's certainly some self-protection going on here on behalf of Silicon Valley. Yeah, I, well, okay, I, I, my, my theory uh, is, is, is this. Uh, the definition of, definition of fascism is, or one of the definitions, is a capitalist economy controlled by the government. And uh, Facebook and Twitter and Google and all of the rest of the uh, platform companies uh, the network companies uh, on the internet are operating as private companies, but they are doing so uh, under the constant threat, the constant shadow of possible severe regulation. They don't have a lot of regulation now. I mean, it's a new industry. They've pretty much grown uh, on their own without uh, the government getting too involved in regulating them. But in, in recent months, uh, we've got all of, you know, the, the Russia stole the election for Trump scare. We have the uh, uh, people who were uh, talking about uh, 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 pedophilia taking part, place in pizza parlors. You know, all kinds of things have uh, come to light that people are, you know, concerned about. Uh, they're concerned about either because it's just not savory or they're concerned about because their, their ox is getting gored one way or another. Uh, and it's a little bit of both, I think. Um, but that taken, you know, that's that's one part of it. The other part of it is is that the uh, CIA, through a, a company called InQtel, which is a wholly owned nonprofit venture capital firm, uh, firm owned by owned by the CIA, they make venture capital investments in tech companies. Uh, everything from uh, what was the precursor to Google Maps to a number of other uh, companies. They, they were the, you know, they, they've got their stake, uh, the financial stake, in a whole lot of various, uh, uh, or various internet companies, some that we know about, some that we don't. So you've got the CIA with uh, a hand in the back door. You've got crazy politicians in Washington with their hand in the front door saying, you know, if you don't shape up and do what we think you should do in censoring people like Alex Jones and, and their like, we'll figure out a way to censor them for you. Uh, so you've got, I would call it, a fascist control of, of, an, of an internet platform. Does that make sense to you? I think you've got an industry that doesn't know what it stands for. I think if you ask any of these people any of these founders 10 years ago, what do you stand for? They say they stand for free speech. They stand for the ability to spread your ideas across the world until, until it's an idea they don't like. Do you think it's an idea they don't like or it's an idea the government doesn't like and by God, they're not going to jeopardize their billion dollar platforms by getting in the way of politicians well, there's, or a combination? There are two things at play here. There is sort of the mob rule 
when there's something objectionable on Twitter or Facebook, something tasteless. Nothing is forcing you to look at that. But still, people now have a voice about what they think is, is right that everybody can hear, thanks to all these platforms. So it becomes this echo chamber. And you have these users revolting against these companies for allowing something to continue. So it becomes this, this ridiculous form of mob rule on the internet. On the other side, you've got Facebook, Google, Twitter. They're powerful enough now that they can influence elections. They reach enough people. A lot of people do political advertising on Facebook. Right? It's a fantastic way to reach constituents. They have some rules surrounding how that works. But well, they didn't to start with. But they, didn't, they do now. Yeah. They do now that they uh, have some questionable practices. As a result of uh, a whole lot of complaints from, uh, from politicians on right. both sides of the aisle. Well, who writes the laws, right? Yeah. And who writes the, and who, who, well, who it's has fun, the power it's, to regulate? It's, it's funny yeah. that the same thing that, that they complained about in the Trump election, that Obama was being um, lauded for being a genius and using social platforms and all the rest of that in, in uh, the previous election. So I think it, a lot of it has to do with the, um, I don't know, I don't want to use the word liberal because it's not the right term, the, the, the bias of media towards the labor party. Um, and um, it, it's, it's upsetting to me because I don't think without these, the, the, the radicals um, throw out the idea and, and they get the, the conversation started by throwing out a radical idea. And then people of reasonable mind start saying, well, maybe there's a kernel of truth in that. You know, maybe at, at that stage it's completely unreasonable and tramples on people's rights and it's economically unfeasible. But what about? And that's a problem with our politics and I think that's a problem with, with cutting out these media platforms. And I think it's a combination of the terrible labor bias of, of the people running the editorial policies for these uh, websites because, well, of, yeah, because they're mean, a favor for the deep state. The yeah, same thing I mean, with newspapers. Yeah. You look at, at people who, who become reporters or journalists are, are um, state that they are uh, middle of the road. But if you ask them a uh, political questionnaire, they are, are like 80% left-leaning. And I think it's the, the same people that go into to the editorial uh, world, the, the, the quote-unquote journalistic world anywhere, whether it's a web or newspapers or anything else. So I think it's a combination of all of that. I think it's terrible. I, First Amendment, um, if you don't like something, don't look at it. If you don't like something, or turn speak, it or, off. Or, or speak your own voice. Speak your, your own, own voice. voice. Yeah, you, your own you know, voice. do your own tweets. The, put the, up you your know, own the, Facebook The interesting page. thing about media in this country has been that it's always been under a bit of control by the government, uh, particularly since the advent of radio and television. Radio is scarce spectrum. It's regulated very tightly by, by the federal government, the FCC, same way with television. Uh, for a very long time, uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS had 90% market share of, uh, of the television viewing audience. It wasn't until cable came along that that started to dissipate a little bit. When that happened, uh, a whole, there's a whole blossoming of different, more independent voices coming out uh, compared to the, the Cronkites and the Edward R. Murrows that basically followed one party line. Uh, and eventually you, we ended up with uh, everything from CNN and M MSNBC on the left, Fox on the right, so that you have a blue media and a red media, a Democratic media and a Republican media, and neither of them talking to the other side. Both media uh, platforms, television platforms, uh, essentially talked to their own echo chamber. Now we're seeing exactly the same thing happen in, in, uh, on social media. We're seeing, uh, with the algorithms that Facebook and Twitter and the rest have been able to put together, your feed on Facebook is the kind of thing that you want to see for the most part. You don't see things that you don't click on or like or share. You see stuff that you already agree with. And so we're seeing more and more a siloing of political opinion by these, uh, these, these, these platforms. Uh, that you know may or may not be a good thing. I, I tend to believe it's probably not so good. But having the ability to essentially silence something like 800 websites because, well, we don't think they 
are hate speech, or we think they are hate speech, or we think this, or we think that. That, I think, is very, very dangerous. Now, that's not to say that other platforms can't come up and materialize and, and compete with Facebook, and I suspect some will. But it's, it's, not a, it's not a good thing when government has that much power to intimidate uh, media platforms, whether they're radio, television, internet, or anything else, newspaper, anything else, into following a government line. And I think that's what we're seeing happen. I think if a company like that chooses to editorialize, as they do, it's a bit of a stretch to call them a platform. They become a news distribution channel. Facebook doesn't editorialize. Well, they do by taking down content they don't like. Okay, but that's not editorializing. That's that's mm. selective, selective uh, editing. But it's not editorializing. They're not putting. They're not saying Facebook believes this or Facebook believes that. Well, but, they're but, saying they're 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 allowing people that they agree with to stay on, or they're allowing people that the government approves of to stay on and taking down people the government disapproves of, or the Facebook approve, disapproves well, of. And I so think that's, that, that's, that is editorializing. That's, they're well, just not, so they're, they're, they're censoring speech so that only the, yeah. their opinion is projected, yeah. right? So anyway, I, I agree with Ted on that one, yeah. disagree with you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all right, it's, though. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a fine point. But it's going to be interesting to watch, because this is, a, this is going to be in play for some time to come, I'm sure. Uh, the zucking of independent media on the internet. Libertarian candidates are great in debates, absolutely great whenever they get to debate, but not too often do they. Uh, one person who did get to debate was uh, Lucy, uh, and I'm going to forget her last name, but it doesn't make any difference because her hashtag is I love Lucy. And uh, she said that in her it's opening not, statement it's in not the trademark. Indiana, Indiana I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I think it's Senate debate. Yeah. And, or governor, I'm sorry, governor debate. Yeah. And uh, the uh, immediate response from her Democratic opponent was, I love Lucy too. And she basically killed in the debate. Mm. But most debates, the Texas governor debate, the Pennsylvania governor debate, or senator debate, all of these, all of these uh, debates, are, you know, what's happening is either the, uh, the sponsoring organization or the television station is running the debate in such a way that it's impossible for a third party libertarian or anybody else to get in. They're saying things like, we want you to have $25,000 in the bank. Not raised, but in the bank, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in your passbook savings account or something. They're saying things like, you have to have 10% in the polls. When there is no polling that includes third party candidates, they totally ignore third party candidates. What they're doing is they're putting up absolute uh, impossible uh, impediments, and of course that's to the benefit of the dinosaur parties, Democrats and Republicans. Ted, would you be willing to debate a libertarian uh, in uh, 2019 or 2020 or whenever you're uh, on the ballot? I would welcome it, absolutely. Okay, okay we're going to hold you. We can do it on the show. We're going to hold you. There. Happy mm -hmm. to. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll host it. Well, could, could you do that? Could you? Uh, we, uh, can, we can host yeah, a, a yeah. candidate debate. Why, the, the, the methodology that people are using, when you, when you I don't know how, how long ago this poll was done, and I haven't actually looked at it, but there's, there's so much uh, urban legend about it um, that I'm sure these polls exist. If you wipe the word libertarian off of a series of questions and ask people both on the left and the right, uh, what do you favor? What kind of economic policies do you favor? What kind of military policies do you favor? What kind of trade policies do you favor? What kind of monetary policies do you favor? Um, you know, healthcare, education, all the rest of that. If you scrub um, the labels off and ask people, something about, it's like 60% plus of the American populace ends up under the libertarian umbrella. But once you put the labels on it, then um, those, those things become, if you tell somebody it's a libertarian platform, they go, ah, ah libertarians are crazy. And, and then you ask them what they are, and they say Democrat slash socialist, and that's always proven itself to be wonderful in history, or, liber or Republican. In many cases, I hate to say it, fascist, but um, it, it, not, not really. Goldwater Republican, I'm all for. So what happens is, of a libertarian candidate, speaks to issues that 60% of the people typically watching agree with. That, that, that's, that happened in, in, in Nevada about four yeah. years ago. Yeah. A guy by the name of Dennis Hoff, who is uh, famous for uh, being uh, the, uh, the uh, 
the lead player in a uh, HBO series, uh, uh, I forget the name of it, but it, Cat House or something like that, uh, is the owner in real life, or was the owner in real life, of the Love Ranch brothel in, uh, in, in, in Nevada. He ran as a libertarian uh, in, in either 2012 or 2014, something like that. He didn't win as a libertarian. He also was, was running, uh, and the reason I say was is because he passed away last week. He was running as a Republican for the uh, State Assembly in Nevada uh, this time around, and the pollsters are now saying that Dennis Hoff, in spite of being dead, but he's still on the ballot and it's too late to take him off, will probably win. So I think that speaks to your point. Hmm. Well, and so who's gets to, who gets to vote his vote? <laughs> One saving grace, he doesn't get to vote for himself. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, if he does win, and, and it's a, you know, a tight contest of over a piece of legislation, will well, they no, just no, turn no. to an empty chair and say, Dennis, how do you vote? No, I mean, oh, if cool. he, I think there's procedures in place. If oh, the I'm just curious. Uh, I mean, if it's he, if he wins, parliamentary there procedure. Another, there will be another you know? election. And, and somebody else will. That's, uh, that seems a shame. Yeah. I think if there are more dead politicians, that would, would be probably would be, be an not advantage. you, of course, but you know. Now, is, yeah. are, are, yeah. do you think people are voting for him because of what he stands for, or stood for, or because he's dead? But I'm, I'm both, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think the pollster should figure that one out. That well, no, I'm, I'm, thinking probably, I'm thinking probably because they can't bring themselves to vote for the Democrat on the ballot. And if they vote for the Republican, if they vote for the Democrat, they're stuck with the Democrat. If they vote for the dead Republican, they at least have a chance to vote again. That's, that would be my guess hmm. as to why people I could be see motivated. Because I could see the to, campaign to slogan now, I promise politician. to die if you'll vote for me. I mean, that, that, could, that could really go over well. We've got of, enough politicians speaking of, to speaking do of, that. of winning, there are some winnable libertarian races in 2018. Just when I get tell going. Us, yeah, to tell that. us a little bit about uh, Jeff Hewitt running for county supervisor in Riverside County, a county larger than the, in population than, the, I think, 14 or something like that states. Well, I think he came in second and uh, um, was it by Campbell? Top two. Uh, top two. Yeah. Uh, and he's now, and I can't remember the Calumisa. name of the town. Thank you very much, yeah. Kelly. So I, I refer to the encyclopedic knowledge of my friend Richard Fields. Despite his advanced age, his mind like a trap. It just closes quickly on things. Um, he's got a he's got an honest chance. And um, when you when you think about Riverside County, there are there are pockets of of clear thinking even in the state of California. Despite gerrymandered districts and all the rest of that, and if you look at Orange County, especially Orange County is one of the, it's 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 like I should do this backwards toward the camera. Where's the there it is? It's like that. Why you would draw a county like that is what you do is you put all the Republicans in one place so that you know they 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 uh, elect a Republican and. Uh, and they don't do harm messing with the with the Democrats anywhere else. Well, the, so, the interesting thing about yeah. about Jeff Hewitt is, as the mayor of Calamisa, he had the city of Calamisa had a pension problem, as do most as cities do, in no, California. As do no all of the cities. But in he California. solved it. What he did, in the fire department. How did he do that? What he did was he said, okay, we are canceling our contract with the union uh, firefighters uh, of Cal Fire. Mm. We're going to set up our own non-union. Firefighting department. He got away with that. And he he, he pushed it through. As he might be my hero. He might hear and me. he's planning on doing something similar for the for the county of uh, Riverside, which has its own pension, uh, unpayable pension mm -hmm. obligations. Well, that Gary well, Johnson yeah. is running for Senate in uh, in in uh, uh, New Mexico. That's his home state, where he was governor for two terms. Mm -hmm. And Gary Johnson, for those of you who uh, only watched. Uh, his his occasional faux pas on on uh, MSNBC. MSNBC, you know, and and gosh, I wish he, he would have had uh, a handler, you know, somebody who could have who could have uh, helped him spin that when he didn't know where you know some city that was Aleppo, Aleppo yeah. being being bombed forward into the Stone Age was, and say, you know, this is not something that politicians should be concerned with. Me not knowing where Aleppo is shows that my focus on economics and the Constitution, which is where it should be instead of fighting wars and foreign. But he didn't do that. But I, I saw, saw the man uh, speak at a rally here in, in Sacramento, and he's a wonderful speaker. He comes across as a genuine person. Uh, he's a successful businessman who built 
his uh, business up from nothing. Uh, he has uh, the support of um, Rand Paul has, has yep. come out for him and a, a number of other people. And if he uh, isn't doesn't get jobbed by by the rules in in uh, New Mexico, actually, uh, actually, then, he's uh, he's been able to he's in all the debates. Okay. Uh, the uh, Secretary of State of New Mexico tried to push through party line voting, which would have yeah. hurt him. Uh, but a lawsuit was filed by so that was the stopped Mexico because I hadn't, I hadn't followed yeah, it. No, yeah, that, that, got, want... that got stopped. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is that he, uh, in the only polls that have been taken, and there are not, it's not a lot of polling in New Mexico, but in the only polls that have been taken, public polls, he is coming in a very strong second to the incumbent uh, Democrat uh, incumbent in, 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 the, in the Senate in New Mexico. He's beating Mark Rich, the Republican nominee, and he's also beating Mark Rich in fundraising for the, the seat. So he'll run a very, very strong second, and he will possibly win uh, the first Senate race in, uh, for a libertarian in, 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 the, in the history of the United States. He's got a shot of, of actually doing that uh, in a state that's now being called safe for Democrats. So I, I have a question about that, and I'd like to focus on Gary Johnson because it is the, it is the single biggest ticket you know, libertarian presence in the country. And the Senate, the Senate is important um, for, for one reason, and, and it's a reason that it shouldn't be important for, is the Senate uh, votes on um, judicial candidates for the federal bench, especially for circuit courts and for um, the Supreme Court. And because of the the uh, legislatures in the in the United States, the, the Congress and the Senate having abdicated their rulemaking to independent regulatory agencies, um, having um, whoever is in the Supreme Court and the Circuit Courts um, has tremendous power in essence to govern the country. So um, having a a, uh, a libertarian. Um, and I don't know where he is on the Constitution. If he's in, if he's a, if he's a, a textualist or what they they used to call it, strict originalist, stri originalist or strict constructionist, I, I have a feeling he's probably much more in favor of a loose set of rules that are clearly black and white and clearly protect all of the rights that libertarians hold dear, which is, you know, the right to free speech and the right to property and the right to earn a living, and and all the rest. The um, the the Constitution of the United States is 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 a pretty cool document. You know, this country was great, it, I, created out of whole cloth on four large sheets of paper, and it's, and and so, when you look at the Senate, you don't realize that the Senate, because again of the abdication of of of, of power, the gift of power that that the House has made, um, to these independent regulatory agencies, is hugely important. For a reason it shouldn't be important. So I think I think if Gary could win, and my question would be on Gary, and, and maybe you you guys pay more attention to politics than I do. I kind of see it as amusing um, in most cases. Um, if if he if he you know is it going to be a three-way race, and are people going to decide Gary can win, and so the Republicans who are Goldwater type Republicans and which libertarian leaning will they jump in and start funding him? Do you think? Uh, he's uh, like I say, he's leading in fundraising. Uh, yeah. He has more fundraising than the Republican already. Okay. Uh, one of the packs supportive of Rand Paul is, uh, has, is putting I think two million dollars into the race. That'd be so he'll, one he million has, more than he had for a libertarian he'll, campaign. <laughs> he'll have enough money to make a uh, you know to make a to make a, a good showing on uh, New Mexico media, which isn't all that. Ex all that, uh, all that uh, expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, other races where uh, libertarians have a choice include Laura Epke. She was elected as a Republican to the unicameral uh, uh, and legislature then, and then switched libertarian. in Nebraska. Yeah. Sli switched libertarian, survived the top two primary, and is running uh, to be reelected in November. Caleb Dyer and Brandon Finney did the same thing in the New Hampshire House. They were elected as Republicans, switched to Republican, running for reelection. Uh, somebody that's running for uh, office uh, for uh, state senate in South Dakota for the first time is uh, Gideon Oaks. He's running in the Black Hills area, mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, Badlands area, and has a pretty good chance of winning uh, in a how, in, in a race where media costs very little and people are few and far between, and you can uh, do a, like where you're you can do yeah, and you can do a very effective uh, door to door campaign. Uh, just you know, uh, talking to people uh, one on one. Same way with uh, Aaron Elward running uh, for the South Dakota 
uh, state house. He's running south of Sioux Falls in an area, again, where it's uh, possible to run a race without spending a whole lot of money. And uh, interestingly, uh, Amber Christensen Beltran uh, is running on a pro-marijuana uh, uh, platform in Utah and stands a chance. Now, if, can I ask you a question because you pay much more attention to the polls than I do. Stands a chance. So this is, Utah is a, I'd say, very conservative state generally. Uh, and and uh, a pro-pot or pro-pot legalization or something is, um, that's a, that's pretty libertarian position. Is she is she running? If you take a look, is she running yeah, third? If you take, is she running if second? You, no, uh, if you take a, I don't know if there's polling, but if you take a look at the position of conservatives, Republicans, a majority of Republicans are in favor of marijuana legalization. And are they like, really? Yes, something like, and I don't know where you stand. If you're willing to, to well, say, uh, look, I haven't seen the poll numbers, but I have serious concerns about legalization of marijuana, especially in California. Okay. Concerns that it's a bad thing, or concerns that what? I, I'm 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 kind of shocked by that. So really? I, well, I'd be interested in your answer. Well, let's let's look at the money first of all. These businesses don't have access to the banking system because marijuana is still illegal. Well, that's a problem with the banking system. Law. Law. Hmm. I mean, we can we can talk about the ins and outs of you know. It looks like we're going to talk about the Federal Reserve always there. So we run out of time. Libertarian so. favorite. Yeah. Um, but they're operating in cash, right? People generally do not kill each other over marijuana. People are long known to kill each other over cash. Well, with a black market, there's more. That's running, running out of cash, too. There's no change there. Right. Well, and, then, and the problem is the banking system, which can be changed. But this that's is, this is a changed, significant not. legislative hurdle. That, and there's no reliable impairment test for police to know when somebody is over the le whatever the legal limit is for marijuana when they're driving. Gonna, well, they, they gonna, claim gonna, they do. They claim yeah. they have they have tools. So you're saying those tools aren't aren't as reliable as they say when they pull people over. Uh, well, they can't instantly test like they can for alcohol. Doesn't it take a while to get the test back? Well, as I understand, these, these things are still under development. Okay. And that there's, there's not a reliable field test for it. Yeah. Well, I know I'd much rather have somebody driving stoned out of their mind they then drive a lot slower and a lot, lot more slower, and they typically drive to wherever has Doritos. I'd much rather they all just stay home. Well, yeah, well, that's I fine. mean that's, that's most, true. Of, most of them yeah. do, yeah. in my experience. That's the show. We're going to have to disagree on this one, not there, but we'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much for watching on Channel uh, 17 in Sacramento, on uh, YouTube, on Facebook, and on the internet at www.accesssacramento.org. Thank you.